This audio is from King's Cross Church in Independence, Missouri. For more information or to donate to this ministry, visit kingscrosskc.com. Today's scripture reading is from John, verses 4 through 13, which can be found on page 886 in your pew Bibles. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is the word of the Lord. My name is Will Turner. I'm one of the pastors here at King's Cross. And this morning, as we continue in the book of John, I get to talk about Christmas in the middle of August. For many of you, you know that I love Christmas, and I will promptly start playing Christmas music after Halloween. Not before, I'm not crazy, but I will start after Halloween, or maybe the first cold day that we experience, but this morning I get to talk about Christmas because the Bible talks about Christmas. Um, Specifically, every Christmas, if you come to a traditional Christmas service, growing up, for me, Um, My favorite part of the service was the very end, when the lights get all turned off, and we distribute candles, whether they be fake or real or whatever. Specifically, the good memories happen with the real ones as kids. Um, (laughs) My sister dripped. Oh, man, she got wax all over the place. Uh, Very good memories. But the point was that they would distribute the candles, and at the very front, we would begin singing Silent Night as the candles would be lit and passed. And you would see the light starting at the beginning, and before the end of the song was over, the entire congregation had their candles lit up, and it was the only thing in the room that was providing light was these, were these candles. And the reason we do that, which have you ever thought about why we do it? Is it just like a special pretty thing? The reason we do that is to illustrate what this text is telling us this morning that Jesus' purpose was when he came into the world. It was to bring light. It was to bring light and not just to be a light for a moment, to be a light and spread it throughout the earth. That's why we sing that song on Christmas. Listen to the lyrics. Silent night, holy night, son of God loves what? Pure light at the end of the song. Radiant beams from thy holy face with dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus Lord at thy birth. It's it's telling us the purpose of why Jesus came. Why, when we read John 1, he's telling us this is why Jesus came. We, saw, we talked last week as we opened up the book that we were going to be in John for a long time. We're going to be in the first chapter of John for a long time, and it's good for us, right? I was talking to someone in the lobby uh, before service about how um, when the angel told Mary that she was going to give birth to the Messiah, she, she pondered those things in her heart, right? She, she sat, and we're going to be, and she said that's what this, how the speed in which we're going through John is like. We're going to be pondering John in our heart. It's going to be slow. It's going to be beautiful, long, thorough work through John, and so we're getting a little further in chapter one today, um, just a little bit further, but if you remember from last week, we're answering specific questions. The first question, big one, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And John wants us to know. John wants us to know that without a doubt, every single person who reads his book will answer that question the very same way. They will know without a doubt who Jesus is. And then we are called to do one thing in the book of John, and that is what? Oh, no bonus points today. We're called to believe. We're called to believe. Why? We talked about what should we believe, why should we believe, what we believe, and what does it even mean to believe. And all of those questions are going to be answered in the next 21 chapters of the book of John. 
It's going to be a lot of fun. But he's pivoting now to talk not about who Jesus is and what Jesus was. Remember, Jesus is God. He existed before the foundation of the world, and all things were made through Jesus. He talks about who Jesus is. Now he's, he's changing uh, the way he talks about him to speak of what he's going to do. Not just who he is, but now he's what he's going to do, and he sets up the story. He tells us the theme of Jesus' ministry, and then he practically shows us how his ministry was fulfilled. It came to be by rolling out that the people of God uh, would start and orchestrate all of the work in this story through the person of John the Baptist, not John himself. And so as we begin, I want you to be looking for the two purposes in which Jesus came. It's right out of the gate. So let's pray and get into the word. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it, that it is not... Uh, it accomplishes everything it means to. It's powerful. And God, when we open it, it's not just reading of a good story, but it is the transformative work of how we all are here, came to be here today. So Spirit, do a work right now. Let the Word change us. And let Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, be recognized this morning as our King forever. Amen. We'll begin in verse 4. It says, In him was life, and life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Two purposes we see right out of the gate that, that Jesus uh, why Jesus came into the world, and these two purposes set up the theme for the rest of John. You're going to see these all through John's writing. You see light and life over and over and over again. Throughout the rest of this book, you're going to see things that show you and try to get you to believe that Jesus is the light and Jesus is the life. In other words, John's saying, in, in order for any of us to have a shot in this world, we need light and we need life. Without it, we are completely hopeless. We are completely hopeless. Ephesians 2 says that we were dead in our sins, right? John is saying the word of God, Jesus, is coming into the world to remedy the terrible reality that we were dead in our sins, we were in the dark, we were in the ground, and dead means dead, right? There wasn't like kind of dead. It's not like metaphorical. We were spiritually dead in our sins, and he's telling us that Jesus is coming into the world to be the light and the life for us dead people. Dead means dead. It means we have no chance. It means we can't see light or behold beauty. We can't see who God is because we're dead. And none of us, none of us, John would say, would understand what Jesus is even doing without him revealing it to us, being the light for us. I was, uh, Kayla and I were in an airplane last month, and I do not like flying. But I do enjoy sitting by the window because if I'm going to die, I want to see how it's going to go down. And <laughs> I, the first, it's a long story, but on the first flight, we didn't even get to sit together. I had to sit by myself, which was not good for me. Uh, I had to sit by strangers, and I don't like to fly, and I really don't like to fly with people I don't know because if something's going bad, I like want to get a hold of them, you know? Um, so I was sitting by st complete strangers who were probably just as anxious as I was which was also not helpful. But on the way home, I got to sit by the window, and I got to sit by Kayla, and it was a great flight. And I was looking out the window, and I was like, oh, look, this is so cool. This is so beautiful. you got to see this. And, of course, Kayla is shorter in stature than me, and she's over a seat, and being a good rule follower that she is, she's not going to climb up and get over and look out the window while the plane's doing its thing. And so she stays buckled in her seat, but she cannot see what I see from her perspective. And it, and it made me realize that it's hard to be amazed at beauty when you're completely blind to it. You can't, you can't like take in the beauty of, of what God has done and what God is doing and what God like has done historically. You can't take those things in and be in awe and wonder if you're blind to it. Just like Kayla was, she couldn't see what I was seeing out the window because she was blind from her position. And John is saying that when Jesus came to be the light in life, he was going to flip open our eyes so that we could see and behold and believe. That's what he's doing. Matt Carter, the pastor of Austin Stone, says, if physical death is the separation of the soul from the body, then spiritual death is the separation of the soul from God. 
And the Bible teaches that if your body dies while you are still spiritually dead, that your fate is forever sealed. As God, the righteous judge, looks at your life, sees brokenness, sees a life that is spiritually dead, and sentences you to exactly what you deserve, eternal punishment and separation from him in a very real place called hell. It's a sobering reality that if our body dies while we are spiritually dead, we will continue to be forever separated from God just as we deserve as broken sinners. And John would want you to see that reality right now when he talks about darkness. He wants you to embrace that you possibly are or were lost in the dark. You were or possibly now even are spiritually dead. You are bound, by, bound for hell by your own choice, your own brokenness. And John would have you see that Jesus is the light and the good news comes as Ephesians 2 continues. It says, as you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So if you're like, oh, we are not all bound for hell, that's what the Bible's telling you right here. Yes, we were. We were dead. We were in the dark. We were in the ground, and there was no hope for us in those verses. But praise be to God that the story does not stop in verse 3. In verse 4 of Ephesians 2, he goes on and says, but God, being rich in what? Mercy. You do get bonus points for that answer, finally. Man, rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. He loved you when you were dead in your trespasses. He made us alive together with Christ. And then he says, by grace, you have been saved. You were six feet under spiritually, in the ground, in the dark, dead. And Jesus calls you up out of that. And by grace, you have been saved because of God's love and mercy for you. And the story of John is telling us that the one who formed the world, the one who spoke it into existence, is God. And he looked into the hopelessness of this broken world and brought light and life to those who are dead. And in doing so, changed your current state and your future destination. Because without him, we were bound for eternal destruction. If you're an Isaiah nerd, back when we did that, uh, you could hear the words of the prophet as he exclaimed in chapter 9, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of the darkness. Isaiah is getting that prophetic picture of the light that would come into the world. John would have you know that belief in Jesus is possible because he turned the light switch of your soul on, giving you eternal life, and one day you not only get to benefit from that, but you get to sit alongside him as the co-heir of an eternal kingdom. That's great news for us this morning. And so to answer the question of why Jesus came, you can boldly proclaim from John 1 that Jesus came to call people that are dead to life. He came to call people that are dead to life to a living, vibrant relationship with God through faith in him. The Apostle John then, after he gives us this picture of our deadness and our darkness, and how Jesus is coming to be the light, bring it into the world, he then illustrates for us and shows us who's going to be the torchbearer of this light. Who's going to be the torchbearer that's carrying the Olympic torch into the world and saying, i got to tell you about this. It's coming. It's coming. John. There was a man sent from God, verse 6, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to where bear witness about the light. Verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood or, or, or of the will or flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So John shows up on the scene. He gives us this picture of John the Baptist, not John himself. Remember, Apostle John is the author. He, he never talks about his own self. He actually calls himself some pretty, you know, fun names later that we get to read. But 
He's talking about John the Baptist coming into the world, and notice that he says he was sent by God with God's message. This isn't like some crazy dude, which John was crazy, coming into the world to preach his own message. He is sent by God with the message that God has placed in his heart. And notice the word witness here. It's John is giving a witness's testimony, as, and, the, and, and the people who listen are the jury. And they have to deal with the very question that you have to deal with, who is this Jesus? John's bearing witness. He's saying, I'm, I'm telling you about this light that's coming into the world. You have to deal with that reality. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with this Jesus that I'm telling you about? What are you going to do with this light that, it, that I'm, I'm preaching about? He tells the hearer to believe, to believe. He comes testifying to the light and to the life that is about to change everything as we read earlier. And he's coming into a very blind world and he's on the stand to share the testimony about the light. I want you to imagine, um, have, you, have you ever told someone when you like walked into a room, uh, you're giving them a tour of your home, right? So you're taking them on a tour of your home and you go into a room and you turn the lights on. Did you ever stop Hopefully not. As I say this, you're going to be like, that would be the weirdest thing ever. So if you've done this, you should maybe not do this on your tours of your home. But you walk into a room, you turn the lights on, you're like, hey, look, I have turned on the light to the living room. None of you have ever done that, right? But when would that be necessary? If you were taking a blind person on a tour, they wouldn't know. I'm turning on the light now. John is, is knowing that the people he's preaching to, they had no idea that they were in the dark. They had no idea that they were wandering around, and he's saying, let me help you by turning the light on. And I'm not the light, but the light is coming. I'm not the light, but he's coming into the world. They couldn't see it. A.W. Pink says, when the sun is shining in all of its beauty, who are the ones unconscious of the fact? Who need to be told it's shining? The blind. How tragic, then, that when we read that God sent John to bear witness of the light, how pathetic that there should be any need for him to talk about it. How solemn the statement is that men have to be told the light is now in their midst. What a revelation of man's fallen condition. The one who spoke this world into being, we abandon him. The one who formed you and spoke you into being, you abandon him. We walked away. We turned at this beautiful gift and we said we want to try it our own way and the brokenness and the curse of sin spread all over the world and God rightfully should have left us in our own mess but he says no I'm going to come back for you and I'm going to turn the light back on and you're going to see me again just as you saw me in Eden and we're going to be family man <laughs> that is the greatest story that could ever be told we need to be brought back to the blindness, though, in Ephesians. Jesus, Matt Carter says, made our eyes, yet we refuse to see his glory. He made our ears, yet we refuse to listen to his glory. Jesus made our heads, yet we refused to bow before him. But for those who would believe, John says, that we will not be overcome with darkness. Back in the beginning, we won't be overcome with darkness. The light is coming into the world, and the darkness will not overcome it. And maybe that's the only thing you needed to hear today, that if you believe in Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, if he is not overcome by the darkness, neither will you. You will not be overcome with the darkness. The secular audience of that message would have heard these things in a creation context, that if the light was existing in the beginning and he was the light and the darkness won't overcome it, they would have understood it about creation. But we know the rest of the story, just as Ephesians was referencing the prince of the power of the air and all of these spirits that are at work against us, what John was speaking to was a very supernatural backdrop of reality alongside of creation saying there's darkness in this world and darkness does not just mean the absence of light, it means the very presence of evil. The presence of evil is here. So it's not just that like, there was darkness because there was nothing and Jesus brought light to that, but he's saying that there is a war going on and, and Jesus will not be overcome by the power of darkness, by the power of evil. Jesus will not be overcome by it. 
It's not just the absence of light. It's the presence of evil here. And if we go back uh, to those wandering in the darkness that we referenced even in Isaiah, they would have understood it in this way, but the hearers then only saw this in creation. So John wants us to give this picture that the rest of John, you're going to see over and over again the darkness moving in on Jesus, and he is not overcome by it. In a few weeks, we're going to read that John 3.16 as God loving not a lovable world, but a world that was full of evil and darkness. He loved that world. Not a good world, an evil world. We need to understand that this isn't just God like taking care of people or doing good stuff. Like For God so loved the world is, a, is incredible because he shouldn't. He would rightfully not do it because of the evil that we have given ourselves to. If we go back to when we talked about, uh, if you talk about Romans 12, Kayla and I are talking about Romans 12 all summer with students at different camps, and we talk about the darkness of the idolatry that exists uh, that is presumed in Romans 12, where we give ourselves over to evil powers, and we think, oh, we're not going to do that. No, we are, every day, the moment we don't choose Jesus, and we choose an idol, we are giving ourselves over to evil powers as we worship those things apart from Jesus. And he's saying that that exists in the world and what God is saving is an unlovable place. And it's great news that he did it. It's great news that this darkness that exists in the world, he will not overcome it. And the prologue is telling us that we should have hope, but if you read the first 19 chapters and stop, it doesn't look good for us. The first 19 chapters of John, there's some cool stuff that happens, but at the end of it, it looks pretty hopeless for all of us who believe. If we read those first 19 chapters, we would call John a liar. There is no account here where Jesus brought life and life. But praise be to chapters 20 and 21. The darkness would not be overcome with the light. John tells us that Jesus himself would be betrayed by one of the closest friends that he had hung out with for three years. But the darkness will not be overcome or that the darkness would not overcome him. Jesus was then arrested by Roman soldiers, and he was was beaten, but the darkness would not overcome him. He was whipped, he was tortured, he he was beaten beyond recognition, but the darkness would not overcome him. People taunted him, they dressed him up in purple robes like a a fake king, and they shoved a crown of thorns on his head, piercing his skull so that blood would flow over his already beaten face. But the darkness will not, would not overcome him. And while being whipped, he was thrown onto a cross and had to drag it up a hill to a place known as the, the place of the skull, which is terrifying. But the darkness would not overcome him. His hands and his feet were were nailed to that very cross and blood poured freely out of all of his wounds, all the wounds that he suffered, but the darkness would not overcome him. His side was pierced by his captors and blood and water poured out on all those around him, but the darkness would not overcome him. And he breathed his last and his corpse was placed in a cold, dark tomb. And right now, if you're reading John and you've never heard the story before, you say, what is happening? The light of the world, the life, where is it going? He's done. I keep holding on to the darkness, would not overcome him, and then this happens. The worst possible thing for any of those who followed Jesus at that time to behold, it happened. All the stock that they had put into him for the last three years, is it gone? You see Peter freaking out and denying his best friend because he thought he was wrong. He was fearful. He doubted. He forgot the promise that the darkness would not overcome. And we know it didn't. We know it didn't. Another way of saying this, this is so beautiful, is the darkness had done everything it could. It schemed and it plotted, but it ran out of ideas. No matter what the darkness does, the light will shine and it will win the day because three days later in that cold, dark tomb, the one who could not be held down, the one who was life, could not be put to death. Death was shaking in its co- to its core because it knew in that moment, oh, I'm done. Death itself was finished. That's why the Bible writers say, oh, death, where is your sting? Because it knew in that moment that Jesus would not be overcome with darkness. It would not be over, he would not be overcome with death. It was finished. 
The light of the world burst forth from that tomb and is now seated at the rightful place right next to his father. And that is the greatest hope for all of those who hear this gospel message and believe. Verse 12 of John 1 says, All who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of what? Of God. So we go from dead in the ground, hopeless, betrayers of God, to children of God, because the darkness would not overcome our Savior, and he and it will not overcome you. It will not overcome you. The promises of salvation and eternal life and the riches of heaven are all yours. Belief in Jesus means that you no longer are aligned with the enemy who you once walked with, and his demons and the darkness are headed for death, and they're not happy about it. It's, they're done. Belief in Jesus means that you are seen as a son and a daughter of God adopted into his family, and because purely because of the magnitude of his mercy and grace for us. And we, as believers, are not just saved, but we are co-heirs as adopted children. And you, you, busted up, broken you, saved by Jesus, are now light bearers, as John was, in the world. You are not the light, but you give testimony to the light. And we're going to reflect that as we worship this morning. This is what being a light is. Being a light that the, a light bearer means that in everything we do, when we sing, when we live in community with one another, when we go on God's mission and declare his goodness throughout the earth, we are reflecting God's light back to him in worship. That's what we're called to do for the rest of our lives as believers. We have been called from the grave to walk in eternal life. And like John, we get to go around, maybe not dressed in weird skin and eating locusts and honey, but we get to walk around Independence, Jackson County, and declare the goodness of what God has done for us, how he saved us, how he is coming again. How he's coming again. We get to hold the great news that while we were dead, Christ came to save us. We get to hold that news and we get to share it with one another. And so as we worship, I want to continue in what we started last week. So last week, if you uh, weren't here, we did a, a little bit different. We're going to have our prayer team like normal over here praying for you. If you need prayer, please go receive prayer from our prayer team. But because Jesus is the light of the world and he came to bring life for all of us, we also want to worship him. And this, these steps are open as an altar for you. If you just want to come and submit yourself to King Jesus, who was your light in life, and without him you were bound for hell, bound for darkness, and bound for separation from God. If you just want to come and be thankful this morning, the altar is open for you. John calls us to believe. And so for some of you, maybe this is the first time that you're hearing this. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing the story of Jesus, the man who came, but who was also God, who was also man walking around in the flesh, but he also created the world. Through the world was spoken through him and for him it was made. All those things, like, and that's the first time you're hearing that. And then maybe this is the first time you're hearing that he didn't just come, but he lived a perfect life and he died a horrendous death, guiltless, for your sins. And if that's you, the call for you today is to believe. And because of his resurrection from the tomb, you can now be a part of this family. The Bible says that you were lost, right? You were dead. You were spiritually dead and separated from God. But in Jesus, belief in Jesus brings you out of the grave into eternal life as his co-heirs in the kingdom forever. This is good news for you today. And so if that's you, find a pastor to pray for you. Find the person next to you. Grab them and say, hey, I believe. Maybe for the first time. The altar is open. Communion is here for those who believe. It's just, it's just represented as the body and blood of Jesus poured out for you. So come as we worship. Believe in Jesus. Celebrate together and reflect his light back to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being our light. Father, thank you so much for looking at this world that deserved to die. And you declared a different judgment for us by sending your one and only son. And making it so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but inherits eternal life in him. 
God, thank you for the the good news of the gospel. God, I pray for those in need this morning, for those struggling to believe that he is the light in the life. God, that you would open their eyes, that you would turn on the light. You would say, look and see the beauty. Look and see the magnitude of my mercy. Look and see the goodness of my grace. For those of us struggling with doubt, God, just be with us, be present with us. Continue to show us those things. Lord, for those of us here celebrating your name, God, that that have come in this morning full of the light and energy that you give us as followers, the thankfulness and joy, God, pour that out more in abundance on all of us. Let us be thankful. Let Let our hearts be filled with gratitude for your saving grace. Father, for those who maybe you're believing for the first time, let them be surrounded by a church that loves them, a church that loves them. And as we partake in communion, let us be reminded of all the goodness that you've done for us through your son Jesus on the cross. Lord, we love you, and we ask you to do miraculous things in our people. And it's in your name, amen.